Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Tom Orzakowski. He is a letterer of, uh, well, I would say legendary status, having worked on the X-Men for 17 years, working alongside Chris Claremont, John Byrne, Jim Lee, basically every artist of note on the X-Men. Tom, welcome to Comic Culture. Well, good to talk to you today, Terrence. So, Tom, let's, let's start with um, the basics. What is a letterer? Uh, a letterer these days is someone who pushes pixels on a screen. Uh, it's self-employed. Um, you work all hours a day, 90, 32 hours a day, nine days a week. It's very exciting. Uh, uh, when I began it, we were pushing pen and ink on Bristol board on penciled artwork, which was what, like that was the reward for doing the job because the rates weren't that good. But getting George Tusco's pencils, John Buscema, like I say, John Byrne, I've worked on Jack Kirby's graphite, Steve Ditko's graphite. Coming out of a silver, I was, the first comics I saw were 1957, 1958. So I saw the entire opening of the Silver Age in both DC and Marvel. And so then starting with them in 73, working on Kirby's pencils, working on Avengers, you know, Jim Stylin's Captain Marvel. It's like, well, that was actually not an old character, but. It was just awesome, is the only word for it. In office with John Romita and Stan Lee, it just, that's why you go into comics. You get to work with the people you've admired through your adolescence. And I think that's why all of us in this generation and all my generation, subsequent generations are there. It's like you're working with Joe Casada, you're working with the people who really got your juices up. So basically, um when a writer writes a script, you're the one who puts it on the page. You write out the dialogue balloons, you write the captions. Um, so you have to be the one who's actually taking a, 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 usually, I guess, a typed script and you're putting it onto the penciled page. And that's, that's amazing. You would get the, the, the pages before the inker has them. So you're putting- That was then. Right. These days we get colored files for the most part. Occasionally it was some black and whites because the colorist isn't done. We're all working concurrently. And yeah, um, they they tell me the bold words. They I choose where the dialogue sits on the page, which I do in kind of a jazz, kind of a, a bebop method, in my opinion. I they tell me what the sound effects are, but I decide what they look like. So and it's well, it's a fair amount of creative control, but it is you know it's supervised. It is owned and operated by the publishers. So when you were uh, getting a script from, let's say, Chris Claremont, he was known for. Um, how can I say this? He, it was almost as if he was getting paid by the, the syllable. Um, so when you get a script from Chris Claremont, I'm looking at some of these, uh, these older X-Men uh, issues, the Dark Phoenix Saga, there's a lot of exposition, there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of soliloquy. So how do you uh, manage to put all of that work onto a page, have it be legible, and have it um, not cover too much of the artwork? And make an income. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me say, first off, I'd go back to Chris in a second. When he calls, I'm there. Um, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to address the, the, the multiple questions. You, um, how do you not do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's it's the X-Men, it's Gene and Scott. You know, as I say, I, I read X-Men. When I read FF1, I read Spider-Man 1. I read Amazing 15. I've read them all. And so to be there with them, there's the professor, you know, there's Logan. It just, after, you know, during the 17 years, I knew these folks. And so the idea is to flatter the script and the artwork equally. So you don't cover stuff up if you can help it. You certainly don't cover the hair. That's like rule number one. Don't cover the hair. Because uh, when they're out of costume, that's the principal identifier. Um, and um, I don't know. It's... It's kind of a Zen thing, especially now that we're working digitally, because when we were doing the X-Men books, certainly like by Jim Shooter's time, and this is not a dig on Jim Shooter, the deadlines had gotten so far out of control, just catastrophically out of control. Before he got there, they would be having emergency, emergency reprint fill-ins on books all the time, because somewhere in the U.S. mail, because there was no Federal Express, he had things, deadlines would get blown uh, I was lettering on vellum overlays, which were then cut out and pasted on to the artwork within the office. And so the dialogue balloons were generally at the tops and the bottoms of the panels. Nothing was floating because I was harder to cut out. 
now that I'm working digitally, I can just dance the balloons all over the page and give equal priority to the faces, the hands, the action, the backgrounds, and the dialogue. And if you look at any current books I've worked on, I think I'm doing Tales from the Crypt tonight for um, paper cuts. I'm kind of scat singing, acting like a jazz performer, just uh, kind of interacting with the artwork as opposed to sticking to the tops and bottoms of the panels. So that's what I do. That's what any letterer does today, besides deciding on making font choices, buying fonts, endlessly buying fonts, <laughs> is designing, interacting with the design of the page. I've done a, a workshop called uh, Lettering is Cosmetic Surgery, What to Do When the Art is in the Way of the Script. And the thing is, don't be afraid. You own the page. Every, while you work on the page, you own it. And so you decide where these things go. It's part of the stage setting. Uh, does this in any way address your question? Absolutely, and, and what's interesting too is, uh, it's like I was mentioning before we started recording, um, a, a letterer is someone that you don't think about unless they're doing something um, bad, I guess. You know, it's kind of like the umpire who makes the bad call. Normally, you don't pay attention because it's just part of the story and you focus on what the characters are saying or what the sound effect is. Um, and what I noticed was, I was, uh, I was saying that I had just received a copy of uh, the Alpha Flight Omnibus from Marvel, and in there, uh, in that collection are a number of X-Men comics, and there's one I couldn't quite figure out what was wrong with it. It wasn't the inks, it wasn't the pencils, and then I realized there's someone else doing the lettering, and I turned to the, the credits, and it wasn't your name. Um, so when you're working on something like this, and you talk about this jazz style, um, you know, how do you manage to get your personality through just what are simple 26 letters? How can you not? <laughs> and again, we're talking, you know, we're talking about pen and ink. I did, um, what the heck, I did Alpha Flight 2 and 3. Uh, I forget who did the first one, maybe Jim Novak, who was like, well, there was the A-list at Marvel at that time. We're talking, you know, roughly 80s, 70s, 80s. Uh, so everyone's pen and ink. And the top people were John Costanza, um, not too long after Joe Rose, and then Jim Novak showed up in like 1975 out of nowhere. He was a sign painter, actually. And just like a rocket, he was like the top, one of the top three guys instantly. And I was on the, the B or the C list because my style didn't look like Marvel, which is kind of remarkable. So I'd get a number of things, and then they figured it, it was, they'd put me on X Men. It's like then I was safely outside of the Marvel Universe. And I could, I figured, oh, that's cool. I'm outside of the Marvel Universe, so I can do anything I want. And I don't, I don't have to look like Marvel. And they respected that, never told me to look like Marvel. On the other hand, I never worked on, outside of my first couple of years as a stringer, any books of note, not Thor, not Iron Man, not Hulk. Those went to the three people I just mentioned. It was kind of interesting. I built myself a little, a little ghetto, a little, um, a little place where I would be. So I do New Mutants, Wolverine, X-Men, but rarely straight into the Marvel Universe. I do special projects, Craig Russell books, uh, things to the side like this, but rarely interacted with Marvel. I never really felt like I was a part of Marvel, if that doesn't sound peculiar. Well, it is interesting because those characters were always considered the um, uh, outside of the traditional Captain Americas because there was always the question of whether or not the X-Men were were, you know, secretly villains or something like that. And I think uh, Chris really played into that with the, the script where, you know, you had the, um, uh, the senator who was trying to get the, uh, the, you know, the mutants outlawed and everything. Um, so it, it's interesting that you say that you didn't consider yourself uh, on the A-list because I think if people are talking now about letter, letterers, uh, they mentioned John Workman, they'll mention maybe Todd Klein or uh, uh, you, of course, or, or maybe Gaspar Saladino or something like that. Um, because your styles are memorable. Um, so I guess there's really no question, it's just me making a statement and, and gushing about uh, how it's always nice to read your work because you manage to make it seem urgent and match the characters without it being um, generic, uh, which is just a, a, an amazing feat, again, dealing just with those 26 letters. Um, so perhaps we could talk a little bit about uh, when you were working on the boards, how you would actually do that, because you were saying it's, it's pen and ink, but let's say you've got a bold uh, word or you have something that's a, a sound effect. Are you using the same tools or are you uh, changing you know, to different uh, uh, pens or something like that? 
Yeah, it was a matter of pens. I had uh, three ink wells set up and regular weight, bold weight, extra bold weight, and a, a calligraphic pen to the side, perhaps, if I wanted to do something, you know, unusual with the captions or all. Um, the idea was to do it quickly. Some of the guys in the office, Rick Parker is like one of the one of the old guys at it now, you know, a fabulous career. Uh, he learned, I think, from John Costanza. This was kind of passed down within the office where I w never was. I was on the West Coast, so I didn't learn a lot of the, uh, the ordinary sensible tricks. They would hone their pens sufficiently that they could use the same pen for regular weight or bold, which saves quite a bit of time if, like, every fifth word a character speaks is a bold word. I had to keep changing pens, and pens can dry out. But ink is alive. You know, you, it, 26 letters, it's true, but have you ever looked through any of the type foundries? There are thousands of fonts, thousands, new ones coming up every day. You know, some look like they're just kind of baby's first font and relatively primitive. But Blambot, uh, if you're familiar with them as a type foundry, a fellow mm -hmm. called Nate Picos, uh, he does two fonts a month, generally. And after Oh, let's call it five years. He's got, you know, a respectable number of fonts. He's carried through a number of the foundries. Comicraft likewise has 500 fonts. I've got no idea anymore. People are developing new, little new kinks, little new points of interest because we want the stuff to look lively, to not look repetitive. Uh, I had a pretty foundational technique I worked out because I did study calligraphy. I've actually got, you know, a, um, a studious background in my work, which I think affects the way the outcomes appeared. I was always trying something new, um, which took a lot of time. But in the process, I got what might be considered also kind of a, a stiff style. It's not as lively as Novak or Jens Chang or God Workman. Just Workman's a genius. It's just <laughs> unbelievable the things he comes up with. He's, he's an alien. I don't know how his mind works. But I worship his mind, and I wish I had one like it. Well, again, when I was reading that one issue of the X-Men that wasn't uh, your lettering, um, it, it's interesting, you seem to have this, the X-Men always had this pseudoscience uh, kind of on the periphery of society kind of look, and your font, uh, your, your handwriting rather, seems to go so well with that. Um, I'm not sure if you're using uh, the same spacing that everyone used, it just, I don't know, there just seemed to be something uh, condensed about it. Uh, the lines always seem to kind of bend one way uh, but uniformed, um, and it just added to the urgency of the book. And then when someone else was doing this, it, just like, ah, it's it's okay. <laughs> well, it was kind of a gestalt between Chris and I, and it was never exactly clear whether he wrote as much as he did because I could always make it fit, or whether I worked as small as I did because I had to make it fit. I think we just came to depend on each other's strengths and um, uh, kinks, tendencies over the time. And I don't know, he just, I, I guess with me, he never felt he had to hold back. He'd just say as much as he had to say, because I'd, I'd make it work. He knew we could depend on me to back him up. So editors, we went through like four or five editors in chief in our time, like a dozen editors, a dozen or more assistant editors. And it was all, and pencilers like crazy. It was always Chris and I on almost every issue. I did like 10 or 11 out of every 12. Mm -hmm. When it went by weekly, when they were annuals, you know, you can't handle everything. I had a small staff, um, Task Force X. <laughs> when my appendix burst and I was out of action for a week, we didn't miss the deadline. And I set up an amazing agony doing copy placements and sound effects and balloons. And it was Team Appendix that month. Uh, five of us in the room doing all the dialogue and sound effects and it was... You can look it up. I, I forget what you sure it was. That's so it's from 1988. Well, that's that's amazing too because um, when when we think about the uh, the process of making comics, the penciler has, let's say, 20 days, 28 days or so to churn out the pencils, um, and then the inker I've heard has about half that time to do the inking. So how much time did they afford you to put all of the the letters on the page? Well, that would vary. Um, you speak of the Dark Phoenix thing, which I think is going to be on all of our tombstones. That's <laughs> the thing that we're remembered for. Um, Jim Shooter saw the ending and said, no, this, this can't go. I think this has been reprinted and commented upon numerous times. You know, she destroyed a planet of asparagus people. 
we can't just give her a lobotomy and send her on her way with a slough on the wrist. She has to die. This is unconscionable. This has gone too far. And so they redid the final third of the book altogether. And the next issue was already in pencil form. Uh, it was 138. So, and it was just going to be uh, Scott and Jean setting up in a little shanty in the back of the X Mansion, you know, building their lives out there under the professor's watchful eye. And Scott's like becoming a little concept. You know, Jean is, she's not the same anymore. They gave her a psychic lobotomy in the original outcome of the story. And it would be Scott kind of adjusting the fact, you know, this, this woman I'm now married to is not the woman I knew, but I love her. I loved her, and maybe she can get better with nurturing and TLC. That all had to be redrawn to be her funeral. And the, the, the center of the story is basically reminiscing upon the 136 issues prior. So that was able to be left intact. But of God Xerox is a lot of it, just Scott and Jean walking through the grounds instead of them being at the funeral of her at her tombstone. There was enough time for that to happen then. We were able to redo a third of the book at that time, and it still came out on time. And that was a double size issue too, wasn't it? Yeah, and so that kind of underscores the amount of time I had to work on the book in those days. And normally a letter would get, you know, three days, four days. Normally you'd be doing, you know, like two books a week. And deadlines had quite a bit of uh, wiggle room in there, so. There was no really set time on the schedule. You know, the printer date is this date. We want it in by this date instead, so the office, you know, the editors, editors can go through it, corrections can go through. It was a more leisurely time. Nowadays, the budgets are so low, the sales are so low, that everything's on a hair trigger. And there's no inventory. There's no free time anywhere. Uh, when it comes to working on Spawn, which I just, that issue 271 just showed up in the mail. I, I sent the final files on that last Friday, six days ago, and it's already out. Wow. I was paid yesterday. <laughs> it's nice. Very nice. Um, I generally, and I've been doing Spawn for 25 years. Generally, I just stay up for 20 hours straight and do it. Because Todd will deliver the scripts starting on Tuesday, he'll skip Wednesday, give me the balance on Thursday, it's due first thing Friday. And it's up to me to decide how my sleep schedule is going to go. And generally, it's just easier and more fulfilling, you could say, from point of view, to just do the whole thing in one sitting. Maybe catch a short nap, 90 minutes in the middle of it. But yeah, just stay awake. That's, that's amazing. So when you were working in the 70s as a, as a, a freelancer, um, is, is lettering enough to pay the bills, or do you have a regular job, and then at night you've got to stay up and just try and get the, the latest X-Men done? No, I've been doing lettering as a full-time gig for, this is the 44th year. That's amazing. I've got the longest career in this field at this moment. That's amazing. Yeah, you mentioned Saladino in your opening comments. Uh, Gaspar, he died uh, this past year. August or September, he was 82, approximately, 88, pardon me, 88, 89. He went to his first convention in his life about three years ago, the New York Comic Con. And so Klein and myself and Iliopolis, is like, you know, like 10 of us, where they just took, you know, kiss his feet and weep. <laughs> and feelings of just horrible inadequacy. Uh, and, you know, he was lying, I was shaken, was there, Len Wein was, you know, just, all these people who worked with Neil Adams, we were just touring the room, just having him shake hands and reminisce with people and smiling to beat the band. And all of us trailing behind, just kind of hoping that some of his genius would flake off and we could just inhale it and be a fraction as good as, we'll never be as good as he was. I mean, that's just not possible. The best has already happened. And Klein is a genius and Workman's a genius. And, you know, I get by. <laughs> we, can, we can make a living at it. Uh, you know, that's not, it, it used to be easier. Uh, page rates plummeted in the last decade. Uh, I'd rather not go into dollar figures, but plummet is a pretty good term. Okay. Well, yeah, obviously I, I never want anyone to discuss uh, anything financial. Um, but, you know, you, you do have, a, a, as you said, a 40 year career, a 40 plus year career. Um, so you mentioned that you got to work on Kirby's pencils. Um, 
So who yeah. are some of the artists that you've worked on that, you know, when you're looking at the book, you realize that this is going to be a, a fantastic uh, read? Well, that was the, um, the pleasure of working on X-Men, on Uncanny X-Men, then um, the unadjected X-Men. Uh, but then it was Jim Lee and Wills Portacio. Uh, X-Men, when it debuted in 75, um, Div Cockrum had had bad relations with the editor where he was drawing Legion of Superheroes at DC, like early 70s. And finally, he'd had enough. And, you know, he knew Len Wein and Wolfman and all the, Roy Thomas, everyone knows everyone else. And so they were looking at X-Men because it had been a loser. But the final year with uh, Roy Thomas and Neil Adams, the sales had ticked up appreciably that they figured, okay, let's re-examine this. It's five years gone by. Let's, you know, revamp the team. Dave had, as you probably know, Dave had some um, leftover Legionnaire concepts. They became X-Men, Storm, Nightcrawler. And the book did okay. Um, Byrne told me once that as much as his issues are famous, they weren't selling that enormously. They sold much better as subsequently. But there were no royalties in his day anyway. The numbers weren't that extraordinary. It took a long time to build. So people, you know, people say that Chris was kind of working on the fumes of the Claremont Byrne days evermore. But it sold much better as time went on with uh, Leonardi, you know, with just the many pencilers over the years. And so I got to work on pencils by Rick Leonardi, Barry Smith. Oh, heck, you know, the mind boggles, Jim Lee. John Romita Jr. is, that was yeah, John my, Jr. my first Boston issue was a John Romita uh, issue. Um, and, and that was one that, you know, again, he's a completely different style from uh, Dave Cockrum or uh, John Byrne or Jim Lee. So it is interesting to see how, uh, you mentioned that there was you and Chris Claremont and I think uh, uh, Glynis Oliver or Ween, she yeah, was, Glynis, she yeah, was she the color. Yeah, she was Ween, they divorced, she became Glynis Oliver. And, and it was like the three of you were the, uh, the you know, the Mick Keith and, and uh, Charlie Watts of the Rolling Stones, but you'd always bring in another guitar player and another bass player uh, to fill in the art duties. And so that, I guess that sort of continuity uh, worked so well with the book because even though we might have a new penciler with a completely different style, I think uh, Paul Smith uh, was on after um, Byrne left and he had a completely different style from Byrne who had a different, st so it's just, it was nice to have that, that uh, cohesive uh, voice and look of the book otherwise. That's what I'm told, Smitty did 10 issues. He wouldn't even do a full year because he just, he, he just can't sit still. He's just, you know, he's so gifted and he's so sparkling, I guess you'd say, that he just didn't want to commit. It's so after 10 issues he'd had enough. And so Johnny was pulled in suddenly, John, John Rita Jr. I think, did he do, I, I forget if he did the second half of issue 175 or the whole issue, hauling some panels. Mm -hmm. And then John, who is still quite new at it, he'd drawn Iron Man for a bit, but that's a single character with a few backup characters, and suddenly it'd be thrown on the top book. Uh, Rubenstein, might, did Rubenstein make some of that? No, he ain't Dave's second, Cochran's second run on it. I guess Bobby Wycheck was thinking of that. Right, I remember uh, the, the issue was uh, that I bought, it was um, the dire wraiths or rats were uh, around, so I guess this was tying into ROM somehow. And it was uh, John Romita Jr. and Dan Green, I believe, was doing the inks. Oh, yes. Yeah, with the nice choppy line work. Yes. Yeah, Dan looked terrific. Brought a real urgency to it. Uh, Bob Wycheck is smoother. Yeah, Dan was a great inker. On, um, oh, heck, Leonardi and I'm surprised they've forgotten the names of the pencils after all this time. <laughs> there were so many. But yeah, I mean, Barry Smith, it was just staggering. You opened the envelope with the artwork that came from the office, and you didn't know what was going to be inside. Rob Liefeld penciled one issue. They felt he wasn't ready yet. And now he's, he's Rob Liefeld. The movies <laughs> are made of his characters. He's it's, it's like the unexpected success story of that generation. There's no Jim Lee character movies. Well, Jim Lee, of course, uh, is, is the, the creative force, I guess, behind most of DC's new, uh, new books, or at least the, the style of their books. But you, you mentioned that you've been working on Spawn for, um, well, I guess now they're approaching, approaching 20 years over at Image. Uh, 25. 25. Um, so 25, yeah, I think of them as a new publisher, but no, they were older than Marvel was when I started there. Marvel was only a dozen years old when I got met in those doors. 
So how do you uh, make that leap? Are you, are you thinking to yourself, well, if I make this move over, I can always go back to Marvel? Is there a fear that you're burning bridges? Are you working on one book for one publisher and one book for another? I work for several publishers. I always did, actually. Well, not quite always. When I was, oh gosh, around 1980, um, the Eclipse and First Comics Pacific were starting up. It was quite a, quite a time for new publishers, new faces in the field. And I knew some of the Eclipse folks from my time in New York. I knew Dean Mullaney. I knew Cat Ironwood. I knew them separately. And there was a fellow named Torrin Smith who, when he was about 20, sold his comic collection. This would be toward 1985. Sold his collection. He knew a smattering of Japanese. He figured manga was going to be a thing that would sell here. He'd seen a lot of anime. And he went to Japan, spent about three years living with animators and just completely disreputable people. A lot of landlords wouldn't hire, wouldn't rent to animators because they kept weird hours and they were messy and they were noisy. And he stayed with people like this as a gaijin. He was like a head taller than everyone else and learned Japanese and got made contacts. And he was one of two people, Viz Communications being the other, who brought Mount manga to the United States in 1987, 1988. And I was working with him in 88, 89 while doing X-Men. I was not exclusive to Marvel, so I was able to, you know, do stuff for Pacific Comics through Mike Friedrich. I was lettering Elric, Roy Thomas, and Craig Russell, and Michael T. Gilbert. Very nice stuff. So it's just been a joy. I mean, uh, I think this really gets down to the basis of why you ask me questions in the first place. I've had the fanboy dream career. I was sufficiently adept at what I was doing that people noticed me and said, could you bring some weirdness to Elric? And I try and stop me. Yes, I can do weirdness on Elric. So I did National Lampoons for a while. I just, uh, if you, it was a Hebrew magazine and it was hot through the 70s and 80s. I think they've been defunct for 25 or 35 years. Um, bring it on, you know. So I'm doing Tales from the Crypt right now. I just lettered uh, the third issue of uh, Wonder Woman by a woman for Dynamite Entertainment, I think they are. I'm doing some graphic novel type things for Ten Speed Press, which is a division of I forget who. Um, comic book his comic book story of beer was a big international seller for them a couple of years ago. I lettered that. It was. You know, like 160 page trade paperback of 6,000 years of brewing. Well, I'm, I'm being told we have about a minute left, and I just wanted to ask you a question that um, I've tried to do this myself. I, I've been working on a comic at home. I do hand lettering on the page. The, uh, the, I believe it's the Ames Lettering Guide. Yes. Was this created by Satan, or am I just mistaken? <laughs> it's a, an engineer's solution to a difficult problem, and it's rather elegant. It's better than labor lettering. If you're familiar with that, the EC Comics are with Leroy. Um, it can be done. My rates are reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to explain how it's used, but once you get your proper setting, it's it's glory. I think Nate Picos's Blambot site might give a breakdown of how the Ames Guide works. I know that Todd Klein covered that in a book he did with Mark Chirello for DC about lettering and coloring. It's out there. Send me an email. email. I'll, I'll give you some <laughs> tips and tricks. Well, Tom, thank you so much for talking with us today. Uh, I've had a great time. Uh, I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We'll see you again soon.